Right. All righty. Well, we have officially reached our start time of five o'clock Eastern time. So thank you all for joining us for tonight's Constitution 101. I'm sure we'll get some other attendees joining us here in the next few minutes. But as always, in the interest of kicking things off for what I imagine will be a really, really great discussion, um, I am Emily Voss. I am the Director of Education at the Robert H. Smith Center for the Constitution at James Madison's Mount Pelier. And I'm really excited this evening to be able to introduce uh, Stuart Leibiger. He is Professor and Chair of the History Department at LaSalle University. Uh, he received his BA from the University of Virginia, just down the road here and his MA and PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. His book, Founding Friendship, George Washington, James Madison, and the Creation of the American Republic, was published by the University of Virginia Press in 1999. He's written numerous articles on the founders for newspapers and for historical magazines, journals, and encyclopedias, and has been a historical consultant for television documentaries and museums. He's worked on the editorial staffs of the papers of George Washington and the papers of Thomas Jefferson, and he's taught numerous teacher workshops. Um, his most recent book, The Constitutional Convention of 1787, was published last year, or I'm sorry, two years ago now, by ABC Clio, uh, and we are inviting him here this evening and really looking forward to a discussion about his book, um, The Constitutional Convention of 1787, and in particular, um, really the interesting quote, a system to last for ages. So what were the delegates to the Constitutional Convention thinking? What were they arguing about? And it was a really dramatic summer. So we are really looking forward to, to hearing from Stuart. And um, folks along the way, if, if you do have questions, please drop those into the chat box. We'll have several opportunities to uh, address some of those questions with Dr. Leibiger uh, over the course of, of the evening. So um, Dr. Leibiger, I will hand things over to you. Thank you, Emily. And good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I teach at LaSalle University in Philadelphia and LaSalle was founded in 1863, just a couple weeks before the Battle of Gettysburg. At LaSalle, we have on our campus, the home of Charles Wilson Peel. Peel was an 18th century portrait painter, painted all the great men of his age. Here is a Peel self-portrait. Another Peel self-portrait, um, Peel was a natural historian and man of the enlightenment. He started the first museum in America, a natural history museum in Philadelphia and here he is lifting the curtain to his museum to arouse your curiosity. Here's a fun uh, Peel picture of his family, even has the family dog in there. Peel raised a whole family of sons and he named all of his sons after artists and all the sons also became portrait painters. And so we have Raphael Peel, Rembrandt Peel, Rubens Peel, and Titian Peel. Here's a Charles Wilson Peel portrait of Washington at Princeton, 1777. If you look into the background, you can see Nassau Hall on the Princeton campus there. There was one occasion where Peel and his sons all set up their easels in a circle. George Washington sat in the middle and all the Peels painted Washington at once. Somebody commented that Washington was getting peeled all around. And so here on our campus is the Peel family farmhouse. Isn't this exactly how you imagine urban Philadelphia? Here's a sketch from Peel's sketchbook of the house. And you can see this dirt road on the right. That is 20th Street, Philadelphia now, which goes right through our campus. And finally, just a couple crude sketches from Peel's sketchbook, of course, of George Washington. So our campus was once the Peel family farm. All right, on to the Constitutional Convention. Let's start with a couple convention fun facts. Of course, the convention met at Independence Hall, Philadelphia. 
but this is not how the building looked in 1787. This is how the building looked, no tower. The original tower had been taken down and the current one was not built until 1828. Nor was the building called Independence Hall. It was called the Pennsylvania State House because it was the capital building for the state of Pennsylvania. It didn't get the name Independence Hall until 1824 when the Marquis de Lafayette returned back to America, went to Philadelphia, saw the building, which by then was dilapidated and falling apart, and Lafayette remarked, Philadelphia, what has happened to your Hall of Independence? And so the name Independence Hall was born in 1824 and the building was saved. Second fun fact about the convention, Everybody knows what the weather was like in Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. Hot and humid, painfully hot and humid. The hot, humid weather has become the stuff of legend. It's part of our national narrative. Not only did the delegates have to overcome the differences with each other, they had to overcome the weather as well. In fact, though, the hot weather kind of a myth. The temperature that summer was below normal. Philadelphia enjoyed a cool summer in 1787 with temperatures below average. The month of July was four degrees below normal. On June 9th, a local resident wrote the following. This is the first day this spring that a fire would be disagreeable so cold and wet has been the season. Of course, even a cool summer in Philadelphia can be uncomfortably warm, especially if it's humid, and we don't know what the humidity was. Humid weather would be especially unpleasant if you're meeting in a sealed room without any ventilation. To the Massachusetts or New Hampshire delegates, even a cool Philly summer would have still felt hot. And even cool summers have hot stretches. So the stories of hot weather are not entirely false, but they are overblown. Third fun fact, here's one of the most famous delegates, Roger Sherman of Connecticut. Sherman helped engineer the Great Compromise over representation. And that's why Connecticut license plates say the Constitution state. Only three delegates spoke more at the convention. But guess what? Sherman only attended by accident. Connecticut originally chose Erastus Walcott to attend, but Walcott turned down his appointment. Why? Walcott had never had smallpox before, and so he lacked immunity. Walcott was afraid if he went to Philadelphia, he'd get smallpox and die. And so Walcott turned down his appointment. In Walcott's place, Connecticut sent Sherman, who ended up being one of the most important delegates. That's what you call contingency in history. Small accidents and chance occurrences changing the course of human events. All right, fourth fun fact. Philadelphia was the biggest metropolis in the US at the time with a population of 40,000 people. It was a center of culture, art, commerce, diversity. The delegates must have been thrilled that the convention met in such a fascinating city, right? Wrong. Believe it or not, many of them hated being in Philadelphia. Oliver Ellsworth of Connecticut wrote, I mix with company without enjoying it and am perfectly tired with flattery and forms. To be very fashionable, we must be very trifling and make and receive a thousand professions which everybody knows there is no truth in. or George Mason of Virginia. He wrote, 
I grow heartily tired of the etiquette and nonsense so fashionable in this city. Mason wrote that on May 27th, the third day of the convention. He's already sick of Philadelphia. John Langdon of New Hampshire, quote, notwithstanding the riches and splendor of this city, the fatiguing sameness makes me sick. And that was after only two weeks in the city. One delegate though, who absolutely loved Philadelphia was George Washington. Washington resided as a guest in the mansion of Pennsylvania delegate Robert Morris. Washington later resided in the same building as president of the United States from 1790 to 1797. Now the building no longer stands, unfortunately. Believe it or not, in the 1950s, when Independence Mall was being built, they knocked the building down because they didn't know what it was. And then after they knocked it down, they realized, oh no, we just knocked down the president's house. Here you can see the footprint of the building. It's right across the street from the Constitution Center today. And one of the ironies of all this, if you look where the slave quarters were, right where the Liberty Bell sits today, just about. So they knocked the building down by accident, and then to add insult to injury, they built a restroom there. In 2002, however, this open air museum opened up, which shows where the building was and what it looked like somewhat. During the 127 days of the convention, Washington enjoyed an unbelievably active social life. And by the way, um, George was there without Martha. She stayed home at Mount Vernon. Washington went out to dinner 106 times, went out to tea 72 times, took 13 day trips, attended a concert or the theater six times, he sat for artists four times and went to church twice. Here's one of the paintings done that summer, a Peel portrait. Apparently Washington brought his uniform with him. All right, enough trivia, on to the substance of the convention. Today's talk is based on my book, the Constitutional Convention of 1787, published by ABC Clio 2019. You can see it's part of a series called Guides to Historic Events in America. Now I wanted to give the book a subtitle, but a subtitle did not fit the series format. And so I couldn't use a subtitle, but the subtitle I wanted, Emily, said it a minute ago, a system to last for ages. That's a quote from Madison during the convention on June 26th. And basically Madison was saying, you know, we're, we are designing a system, a framework of government to last for ages. There are many books on the convention. Mine is fairly short under 250 pages of text, scholarly, factually accurate, based almost entirely on primary sources. But most important, I wanted to write a chronological narrative of the convention. When people teach or write about the convention, they often use a topical format that presents the convention as a series of compromises large versus small states, north versus south, federal versus state powers, legislative versus executive versus judicial branches. 
I've used that topical format in college lectures. The topical approach is organized and it's neat and tidy, but it's a little bit too neat and tidy. In reality, the convention was messy. It meandered all over the place. Nothing ever seemed finalized because every decision of the convention was reconsidered and changed again and again. Instead of using a topical approach, my book is a chronological narrative that captures the complexity and messiness of the convention. A chronological narrative is difficult to write. But what I try to do is to tell a story from beginning to end. The convention met from May 25th to September 17, 1787. It met Monday through Saturday. The delegates took Sundays off. They sat about five hours a day, usually 10 to three. How many states were present? 12. Rhode Island was absent. But 12 states were never actually there at once. There was never more than 11 states present at one time because New York left for good before New Hampshire arrived. And yes, Alexander Hamilton returned at the end, but New York was not officially represented because New York needed two delegates to be present to be officially represented. Each state specified how many delegates had to be present for the state to be officially represented. Anywhere from one to four delegates. Some states required only one delegate present to be official. Other states required as many as four. The convention voted by state, like the Continental and Confederation Congresses. And so inside Independence Hall in the assembly room, there's tables. The delegates would sit at one table from each state and they would cast one vote. Connecticut votes yes, New York votes no. With no more than 11 states present, all it took to carry a vote in the convention was six states. 74 delegates were elected by the states, but 19 stayed home, did not attend. Maybe the most famous non-attendee would be Patrick Henry, who declined to attend because supposedly at least he said he smelt a rat. So there's a self-selection process among the delegates with those less sympathetic to a stronger federal government not attending. 55 delegates attended, but there were only about 40 present on any given day. They were rich white men, lawyers, planters, merchants, army officers. Their ages ranged from 26 to age 81. Jonathan Dayton of New Jersey, the youngest, age 26. Ben Franklin of Pennsylvania, the oldest at age 81. None of the delegates were in their 70s. The second oldest was Roger Sherman at age 67. George Washington at age 55 was one of the half dozen oldest delegates there. Ben Franklin was so old that he could not walk the two blocks from his home at Franklin Court to Independence Hall. And so each day he was picked up in a sedan chair by four convicts from the Walnut Street prison who were out on some sort of prison release program. They'd carry Franklin to Independence Hall each day and bring him home. Franklin was too feeble to deliver his speeches in person. And so he wrote them out and James Wilson read the speeches for Franklin. Franklin did not make distinguished policy proposals at the convention. His suggestions were mostly ignored. 
but he played a valuable role promoting conciliation and compromise. All right, here's one of the most valuable features in my book, but I can't claim credit for it. It's a table of speeches, motions, and committee assignments in the Constitutional Convention. This was compiled by John Kaminsky at the University of Wisconsin, and he very graciously allowed me to publish it in my book, and uh, I think it's published here for the first time. So a list of all 55 delegates and the number of speeches, motions, and committees served on. And the order is from the most speeches down to the least. And so you can see James Wilson gave the most speeches at the convention, 172. Now, the convention actually met on 81 days that summer. So anybody who's giving more than 162 speeches, and you can see that's three guys, Wilson, Morris, and Madison, they are averaging more than two speeches a day. Pretty amazing. So what was the charge to the convention? What was their assignment? The Confederation Congress instructed the convention to revise the Articles of Confederation to make them adequate to the exigencies of the Union. But what if a revision of the Articles could not solve the problems of the Union? Then what? The Convention's answer, they did not revise the Confederation, they threw it out. They scrapped the Articles of Confederation. Instead, the convention proposed a national government of people because only a national government could save the Union, in their view, not a confederation of states. So what's the difference between a confederation and a national government? A confederation is a league of states where you have a national government and state governments but the states are supreme. Real political power rests at the state level in a confederation. Also in a confederation, the central government interacts with the state governments, but does not interact with the people. Only the state governments interact directly with the people. That is in a confederation, the states act as intermediaries between the central government and the people. So, for example, the Confederation Congress could not impose a tax on the people. Only the state governments could do that. Indeed, under the Confederation, Congress did not have the power to tax at all. All it could do was requisition the states, that is, ask the states, may we please have money? And it's up to the states whether to give the money or not. This led to a problem called free riding. Some states say, well, we'll let the other states pay their requisitions, we won't pay ours, and we'll enjoy the benefits. Maybe you have some friends who are free riders. The Articles of Confederation did not have a Bill of Rights because the Confederation did not interact with people. So it could not violate people's rights, no need for a Bill of Rights. Under the Confederation, Congress only possessed powers expressly delegated to it by the Articles. All other powers belong to the states. The bottom line, that is a weak federal government. Now, a national government, in contrast, is supreme to the states, and it interacts directly with the people without the states acting as intermediaries. All right, let me stop there. And how about if we do a question break? Sure, so folks, if you wanna go ahead and drop any questions into either the chat or the Q&A feature, you can certainly do that. Um, in the meantime, I have a question. So uh, you talked quite a bit about the delegates. Who actually extended to the delegates the 
invitation or opportunity to go to Philadelphia? Was there some sort of voting yeah. that took place? That was done by the various state legislatures. Okay. Um, they chose the delegates. They chose how many to send. And again, all together of all the 13 legislatures, 12 actually appointed, they appointed 74 and then 55 of those attended. Now, New Hampshire is an interesting case. New Hampshire, I believe, appointed four guys, but did not appropriate any money whatsoever for their expenses. And so nobody went until you get to, to um, mid-July. You know, it's mid-July, New Hampshire isn't even there, even though they've, attend, they've got delegates, but no one's gonna pay their bill. And then finally, one of the delegates, John Langdon said, enough is enough. I'm just gonna pay the bill myself. I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna bring my colleague, I believe it's Nicholas Gilman was the other one from uh, New Hampshire. And I'll, I'll foot the bill for both of us so that New Hampshire can be represented. So New Hampshire finally arrives in late July. So there's an interesting case right there. And, and you know, a lot of these delegates, one of the reasons they were miserable in Philadelphia is they were hurting for money. Very few states provided enough money uh, for a three and a half month stay in Philadelphia. So these guys were begging and borrowing money. And in some cases, um, they were worried they were gonna be stranded in Philadelphia because they had no money to get home. I guess that gave them a pretty good sense if they had not already served in the Confederation Congress, what it was like to serve in the Confederation Congress. This is why we need a stronger central government where the central government will pay the salaries of uh, and the travel expenses of, of the uh, Congress. Oh, um, another question then. So we know that the delegates were charged with modifying the Articles of Confederation first. They were not charged to go to Philadelphia to craft a new kind of government. So is there any indication what the reaction was like at the convention when Madison and the Virginians show up with this completely different plan? Right. So when the Virginia plan is introduced, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, but uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's genuine alarm among some of the people who are not devoted to a really strong federal government. I mean, they're, they're kind of terrified by this. And some of them right away argue, you know, we can't do this. This is beyond um, the permission that we've been granted by our states. James Wilson's answer to that is, all we're doing is making a proposal. You don't need power to, to make a proposal and that's all we're doing. Um, but one of the things, uh, some of the, you know, some of the more anti-nationalist delegates, one of the things they, they start frantically writing letters to their colleagues, get here fast <laughs> because, you know, um, this is not what we expected and, and uh, we need to throw up some opposition. That, that is, yeah, that's always an interesting point, right? So the, the other delegates that, that were there, um, you know, you gave us some of their, their personal statistics. How many of them had previous experience in some kind of government body, whether it was their state or whether it was the Confederation Congress? How many of them actually had boots on the ground, so to speak? No, I, I, I don't have an exact answer to that, but I would be willing to bet um, it, was, it was all of them. Okay. It may not have been national experience, um, but I, I imagine all of them would have had political experience at least at the state level. Um, but, but most of them probably national experience as well. But I would say, pro again, I, I don't know for sure, but probably all of them at either the national or state level. And a lot of them knew each other already from their previous experience, either in the Continental Army, um, the Confederation Congress, the Continental Congress, and so on. Um, and Eric has a great follow-up question, which I would love to hear the answer to myself. So related to Patrick Henry smelling a rat. Was there any kind of speculation prior to the convention that the delegates were going to come up with something this potentially radical? Was there rumors? You know, um, I don't have a good answer to that question. Uh, I imagine there were some concerns that that might happen. But you know, 
Patrick Henry, of course, he becomes the arch anti-federalist, you know, fighting tooth and nail against the Constitution later on. Patrick Henry would have been better off, I think, if he had simply gone to the convention and done his tooth and nail fight there. And then it probably wouldn't have been such a powerful, um, you know, government that he had to fight against later on and then fight the losing battle, I think. Patrick Henry would have been better off going to the convention and being an obstructionist there rather than later on. In other words, by the time Patrick Henry realized what he was up against, it was it was really too late in the end. He wasn't able to stop it. Yeah, his um, the experience in the ratification debate in Virginia is, boy, we could do a whole other thing just on that. <laughs> um, all right, and so Pat, um, Pat Campbell, who's one of the, the guides at Montpelier, he has dropped into the chat box for anyone interested, some of the more um, tidbits about some of the individuals. So we've got eight signers of the declaration, eight governors or former governors, <laughs> 15 of them had drafted some state constitution. Um, most of them were, um, let's see, half of them were war veterans and about a quarter of them were large landholders. So thanks for that tidbit, Pat. <laughs> so, you know, they, they have tremendous experience. You know, as a group, they're pretty young. I think the, I, I never calculated this myself, but I've heard that the, the average age was 39, which is pretty young for a body of this sort, but tremendously experienced. Mm -hmm. And you know, what they're gonna do is they're gonna craft a government where there's actually nothing new in the constitution. Every, every single part of the Constitution had appeared somewhere before, either in a state bill of rights or a state constitution or the Confederation, but they're obviously going to make a whole new mix, but, but each component will have been used somewhere else before. I think that's a great kickoff. Um, and uh, we have another question, which I'm sure you'll get to as well, about whether or not the concept of federalism is unique to our constitution or was that also one of those ingredients that you just spoke of that had been derived from some other source? Well, uh, you know, people have argued that one of the inspirations was the Iroquois Confederation that, that uh, you know, having read the debates of the constitution, there's not one single mention of the Iroquois Confederation in there. So, it, um, it would have to be indirect rather than than direct, but but certainly this this government, and we'll talk about it a little bit as we continue. It is something new in that the central government itself will be partly national and partly federal. It will be a compound republic, and I think that is is something that's that's you know very very if not unique, certainly close to it. Um, Obviously, there's been all sorts of governments in the past that have a central government and state governments. You know, Madison's conclusion in studying the history of ancient and modern confederacies, though, was that the states were always too strong. Um, so um, this is going to be sort of a new blend, but um, in that sense, federalism is not new. That's great. Well, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about that in a little bit. So I think we'll, we'll go ahead and let you carry on uh, okay. once we've gotten ourselves past May 27th. <laughs> All right. On May 25th, um, the first day, George Washington was unanimously elected the convention president. He was elected by a vote of states. There were seven states present, so the vote was 7-0. Now, Washington is pretty silent during the convention. He only gave two speeches, a short one on the first day and a short one on the last day. So why so quiet? Is it because he had nothing to say and he's just a figurehead? No. Washington had really strong views about the issues before the convention. But as convention president, he wanted to stay above the fray. And he's not an orator. You know, that's not his forte. But Washington found other ways to influence the proceedings. There's a wonderful story that comes from Delegate William Pierce of Georgia. So one day at the end of the session, somebody carelessly left behind notes that 
endangered the secrecy of the convention, which we'll talk about in a minute. And so on his way out, George Washington picks up the notes. And the next day he admonished the delegates. Washington said, gentlemen, I must entreat you to be more careful lest our transactions get into the newspaper and deserve and disturb the public by premature speculations. I know not whose paper this is, but whoever owns it should take it. And Washington put the paper on, the sheet, uh, uh, on a table and he walked out. <laughs> Nobody ever claimed those notes, okay? Now, Pierce, who tells us the story, he reaches into his pocket for his notes and his pocket is empty. And Pierce panics. I'm the culprit. <laughs> I left the notes behind. And then Pierce runs home and he checks his coat at home and the notes are in his coat pocket. And he's, he's like, thank goodness, I'm not the one. But the bottom line, when Washington called you out, you trembled with shame like a child. All right, the convention adopted the following rules. Again, one vote per state. The small population states love that. One state, one vote, because that makes little Delaware just as powerful as mighty Virginia, even though Virginia has 13 times as many people as Delaware. Any motion that was agreed to could be reconsidered. Reconsidered later, and so nothing is final. That made it possible for the convention to experiment and take chances and be bold. And then we have the secrecy rule. The proceedings are secret. <clears throat> Why secrecy? Secrecy ensures that the delegates talk to each other instead of grandstanding for the media. Secrecy allows the delegates to speak their mind freely. Secrecy allows the delegates to change their minds without being accused of inconsistency. <clears throat> Secrecy prevents outside pressure groups from influencing the proceedings. And secrecy minimizes false rumors from disturbing the public. It was not unusual for legislative bodies to meet in secret in the 18th century. Most, but not all of the delegates followed the secrecy rule. Washington followed it scrupulously. And he even writes in his diary, the convention is secret. And so I'm not gonna write anything about the convention in my, in my diary. <laughs> now, Ben Franklin would entertain guests at his home here he is entertaining Hamilton, Wilson, and Madison under the mulberry tree. And there was one evening where Franklin is showing his guests this scientific specimen that he has. It's a two-headed snake that is preserved in a jar. And Franklin's showing this thing and he says, you know, this reminds me of something that happened in the convention today. And he's starting to tell the story and then someone says, ah, Dr. Franklin, secrecy. And so Franklin can't tell the story. So if the convention met in secret, how do we know what happened? Well, that's an easy one, right? <laughs> there were 10 note takers at the convention. Rufus King, Alexander Hamilton, Robert Yates, John Lansing, George Mason, William Pierce. But of course, Madison was the most important because he was the only note taker who was there every single day from beginning to end. Of all the, sur the surviving notes that we have, Madison took 75% of them and everyone else combined took 25%. Madison wrote shorthand notes during the debates and then copied them out longhand as soon afterwards as he could. And so here's a page of Madison's longhand notes. In printed form today, it comes out to about 10 pages a day that Madison wrote. 
or about 700 pages total. Of the delegates, Madison was the last survivor. He was not the youngest, but the last one standing, dying in 1836 at 85. Madison arranged for the notes to be published posthumously. So the notes are not published until everybody's dead. And so even though the secrecy rule is lifted on the last day of the convention, Madison still felt some obligation to it. And so the notes are not published, his notes, until everybody's dead. So there's the great little Madison, as Dolly called him. A contemporary once said about Madison, quote, I never saw so much mind crammed into so little matter. All right, why did Madison take the notes? As a student of history, he was disappointed that no accounts existed of the founding of the ancient confederacies. He wanted to spare future generations that frustration. How accurate are Madison's notes? Are they a sacred and unquestionable text? Well, a couple years ago, Mary Builder wrote this book, Madison's Hand, and she argues that Madison doctored the notes after the convention to make himself look better. He actually inserted new versions of his speeches later on. To make himself look less nationalist and more anti-slavery. Well, the problem with this, in my view, and, and Gordon Lloyd puts it quite well when he says, if Madison doctored the notes, then he was a lousy doctor because I think there's so much more he would have changed if he was trying to enhance his reputation. Read the notes, Madison looks stubborn, uncompromising, a sore loser at times. He bullies and threatens the small states. So I think we have to remember, the notes are a primary source and we gotta treat them like any other primary source. It's one person's account of an event. And so we have to watch out for biases and corroborate the notes with other sources where we can. There was a convention secretary, William Jackson, but he only recorded the motions and votes, not the speeches. And that's really what Madison is doing, the speeches. The convention got down to business with Madison's Virginia plan, presented to the convention by Virginia Governor Edmund Randolph on May 29th. So the Virginia plan is written by Madison, endorsed by the Virginia delegation, introduced by Randolph. The Virginia plan proposed a national government of people, not a confederation of states. There will be a bicameral legislature with representation in both houses based on free population or taxes paid. The lower house would elect the upper house. Congress would have the power to veto state laws that conflict with the constitution. There would be an executive judicial council to review bills and veto them if necessary before passage into law. For three weeks, the convention debated the Virginia plan, debated in the Committee of the Whole. Whenever the convention went into the Committee of the Whole, Washington stepped down from the chair and Nathaniel Gorham of Massachusetts would chair the proceedings. In the end, the Virginia plan emerged triumphant with only a few changes. One change, the state legislatures would elect the upper house instead of having the lower house elect the upper house. That's a defeat for Madison because he saw poorly designed state governments as the problem. The state legislatures are too short-sighted 
you know, for Madison, the states encroached on Congress's power. The states invaded each other's turf. The states violated the rights of minorities within their borders, religious minorities, for example. And so for Madison, the states are the problem. Let's not let them have a hand in this new federal government. Let's remove the states from the equation. The other big change to the Virginia plan is the addition of the three-fifths clause. Enslaved people will count as three-fifths of free people towards representation in Congress. This clause was applied to both houses of Congress. And what's the logic? Many delegates felt that a legislature must not only represent people, but also property. Representation should be based not just on how many people there are, but on how much property they own. And the South has this peculiar property, enslaved people, that it wanted represented. The South wanted slaves to count as five-fifths of people. The North wanted zero-fifths, and so they compromise at three-fifths. The three-fifths clause was introduced by Wilson of Pennsylvania and Charles Pickney of South Carolina. A coalition then backed the overall Virginia plan. Large states and deep south states. Large states, Virginia, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. And deep south states, North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia. That's six states, that's a majority of the convention. And so out of this, the big states get representation based on population, and the Deep South gets the three-fifths clause. And so the small states are an isolated minority. Madison is riding high, and he won't budge an inch. But Madison becomes too overbearing, and that forces the small states to come together in opposition. On 15 June, William Patterson of New Jersey presents the New Jersey plan or the small state plan as an alternative to the Virginia plan. There were some small state delegates who, who favored a powerful federal government if they had a strong voice in it. Madison's intransigence drove these small state nationalists to ally with the anti-nationalists behind the New Jersey plan. And so when the New Jersey plan is introduced, John Dickinson says to Madison, now you see the consequences of pushing things too far. You were too stubborn and you provoked a backlash from the small states. So the New Jersey plan, keep a confederation add executive and judicial branches to it. Keep one vote per state in a unicameral legislature. Grant Congress the power to regulate commerce. But under the New Jersey plan, much of the revenue is still going to come from requisitions on the states, and that is still going to be based on state population. And so Delaware and Virginia would have equal representation in Congress, but Virginia is going to pay 13 times as much in requisitions. The large states would never agree to this. And so perhaps the New Jersey plan was a bargaining ploy. That's what Michael Klarman calls it, a bargaining ploy to get state equality in one house of a bicameral legislature. The bottom line, the small states demand state equality in one house of the legislature. On June 18th, Hamilton delivered a long speech that helped kill the New Jersey plan. Hamilton praised monarchy as the best form of government 
and questioned the viability of Republican government. Hamilton called for an incredibly powerful central government, a president and Senate for good behavior, essentially life. Some argue Hamilton's plan was not serious. It was just intended to make the Virginia plan look reasonable in comparison. But Hamilton was serious in that he wanted the American government to come as close to monarchy as possible. The New Jersey plan voted down after only four days on 19 June. But the small states drew a line in the sand. They want state equality in at least one house of the legislature. This impasse over representation lasts throughout June and into July. And it gets ugly and threatens to break up the convention. At one point, Rufus King, who's a big state guy from Massachusetts, he looks right at the Delaware guys and says, you know, we can do this the big state way based on population, or we can just go home and become separate states, separate nations, really. That's supposed to be a threat to intimidate Delaware. But the Delaware guys were not intimidated. And so Gunning Bedford of Delaware looks right back in King and says, fine, let's go home now. Let's be separate nations. Delaware will take the hand of a foreign power for protection. All right, that's fighting words. That's the founders' worst nightmare. The states break apart, become separate nations, ally with European powers, militarize against one another. America becomes like Europe, periodically torn apart by wars. It got so ugly that Ben Franklin asked that a minister be brought in to pray with the delegates. Franklin, the man of science and enlightenment, seeking divine intervention, that's how ugly it got. Well, Connecticut swings into action and starts hinting at a compromise. And there's a call for a grand committee of a delegate from each state to resolve this. Abraham Baldwin of Georgia changes his vote, which, is, which allows the Grand Committee of 11 to be appointed. One delegate per state chaired by Elbridge Gary. And this committee is stacked. All the guys from the large states are compromisers. All the guys from the small states are hardliners which means who is left off the committee? The ultimate hardliner, James Madison. So the composition of the committee bodes well for the small states. And yes, that committee pro uh, proposes the great compromise of July 16th, the House based on population, state equality in the Senate. And that great compromise passed when Massachusetts deadlocked and North Carolina switched its vote. The Great Compromise created what Madison later called a compound republic. The federal government itself is part national and part federal. The House is national, it's elected by the people. The Senate is federal, it's elected by the states. And so what the Senate does is it gives the states a check on the federal government. And so the Senate not only protects the little states, it protects the states, period, or the states as states, because the state legislatures elect the Senate. And so nothing can become law until it's passed by a majority of the states in the Senate and by a majority of the people through the House of Representatives. This great compromise of July 16th was a turning point milestone in the convention. From then on, it is clear the convention is gonna agree on a constitution. 
It's just a matter of ironing out the details, which will be time consuming, but there's light at the end of the tunnel. From then on, the small state nationalists support a strong central government, people like Patterson and Dickinson. From then on, the big state nationalists are very wary of a powerful Senate controlled by the states. And so they wanna shift some of the Senate's powers away to the president, appointment power, for example. All right, let's take another question break. Sure, yeah. So we have a, a couple of questions that are kind of almost structural in nature. Um, and one of them relates to a question I was gonna ask as well. Um, so Al asks, okay, so if we go back to the Virginia plan, how would it work uh, when we talk about the lower house electing the upper house, would it be the Virginia congressman would vote for the Virginia senators or is there some sort of block necessary in the house that would vote for the senators? Great question. And my understanding is they never got that far. They never really sorted out how that would work. That's the kind of details that they're gonna be working on starting after the Great Compromise. Okay. And so that was gone by then, so they never faced that level of detail. Okay. But one of the objections against this whole concept of um, the lower house electing the upper house is if it was done the way you suggest with each state picking their people in the upper house, that means Delaware is gonna get at least one and that means the upper house is gonna to start to get really big, okay? Because if Delaware gets at least one and you base it on representation, the upper house is gonna to start to get very big in size. And that's one of the things they wanted to avoid. The upper house should be smaller and more deliberative. But that's a great question. And another great sort of nuts and bolts question pertaining to the Virginia plan. So with that plan, revenue would be based on requisition and Washington calls requisitions the most timid form of a request. So um, Al asks, uh, does this mean that under the New Jersey plan, payments would still be voluntary with Congress having no power to enforce them? Basically, the how to, how yeah. to rectify the issue the articles had over actually getting the states to pay. <laughs> so if, if you have the Virginia plan, which is a national government of people, it's no longer requisitions. Okay. Because the states are not going to be intermediaries anymore. It's going to be the federal government directly taxing the people. And so that's enforceable. Okay. But if you go with the New Jersey plan, that's still a confederation. The states are still intermediaries. We're still doing requisitions. And so presumably it's going to be up to the states whether to pay that money or not. And so we, we may still have this free rider problem. Although there was talk about should we give Congress the power to coerce the states, <laughs> which of course the small state guys are terrified by that prospect. But, but there, is, you know, there is this sense we got to make it work, but it is still going to be requisition. So, so again, that's another thing that never really got sorted out because they went in a different direction. So um, thank you, Al. Those are two really great questions. Um, my question is, so, you know, Madison was, you know, you kind of uh, paint him as very distrustful of, of state legislatures, which is really interesting because he was in the Virginia House of Delegates. So was he, do you know if he was considering his own experience in Virginia or was he more looking at like Pennsylvania with its unitary situation and looking at that example saying, I don't trust these people. Yeah. Yeah. Another great question. You know, Madison, we often think of him as being this book learning guy who studied ancient and modern confederacies, but he's also a practical politician who's seen it all in the Confederation Congress and in the Virginia State Legislature. By the way, the, the reason Madison leaves Congress and goes into the Virginia legislature is because the Articles of Confederation had a term limit provision. Three years and you're out. And so he has to leave Congress. He goes into the Virginia legislature. And he's pretty much appalled by what he sees in the Virginia legislature. 
you know, um, these guys in, in Madison's view, these guys are a bunch of rookies in greenhorns and they're not up to it. And the state constitution gives them all the power and they're not exercising it responsibly. And so they're encroaching on Congress's power, they're trampling other states, and worst of all, they're violating the rights of minorities within our own state, it's, it's majority tyranny. So yeah, he was, he was pretty disturbed by what he saw in, in his own state, the Virginia legislature. All right, any, uh, any other outstanding questions from our participants? You guys have asked great questions so far. All right. All right, carry so on. The Great Compromise then, it's really a devastating defeat for Madison. A bitter defeat that he did not want to accept at first. But that's just the beginning of Madison's defeats. Next, the convention got rid of, defeated Madison's congressional veto of state laws and replaces it with the supremacy clause and prohibiting the states from doing certain things like coining money. Next, Madison's Council of Revision gets defeated and it is replaced by two things, a presidential veto power and judicial review which is not written into the constitution, but the delegates understand that that's what's gonna happen. Madison wanted this council of revision because he thought the legislature Congress was gonna to be too powerful as they were in the States. The president's gonna to be too weak to veto. The Supreme Court's gonna to be too weak to exercise judicial review. And so we need to combine them together to match the legislature, Congress. At the end of July, the convention appointed a committee of detail to prepare the first draft of the constitution. Most of the work was done by Randolph, John Rutledge of South Carolina, and James Wilson of Pennsylvania. The committee of detail draft is presented to the convention in early August and it introduces some new features. It enumerated the powers of Congress for the first time instead of a blanket grant of power. But it also included a necessary and proper clause to give Congress some wiggle room. The draft constitution also included tremendous protections for the South and slavery. The international slave trade into the US would remain open forever. Slave imports and all exports could not be taxed. And the draft constitution required a three fifth supermajority in Congress to pass commercial laws. That would essentially give the South a veto on commercial legislation. During August, Northerners, especially Rufus King of Massachusetts, fought back against these pro-South, pro-slavery provisions and scaled them back. Instead of remaining open forever, the slave trade could be shut down in 1808. And of course it was. Slave imports could be taxed. And a bare majority can pass commercial laws instead of a super majority. In return, the South secured one additional benefit, a fugitive slave law. By the way, the word slave never used in the constitution. It's always such persons, other persons. Okay, the presidency. Delegates agreed this was the most difficult issue. 
would the executive be a single person or a, or a committee? A plural executive. How would the executive be elected? How long of a term? What powers? Could the person be impeached? The dilemma, of course, how do you create a democratic president that is answerable to the people, but a president at the same time that is strong and independent? A democratic president, but a strong and independent president. How do you do that? In the end, the convention went against the whole grain of the revolution. They created a strong independent executive in a revolution against a strong independent executive, the king. And why did they do that? Because they knew that George Washington would be the first president and he wasn't going to abuse his power. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say the presidency is designed with Washington in mind. Now this debate over the president, it would go in circles. They would say, well, what power should the president have? Well, we can't decide what power he has till we know how he's elected. So let's talk about how he's elected. Well, we can't talk about how he's elected until we know how long his term's gonna be. So let's talk about how long his term's gonna be. We can't talk about how long his term's gonna be until we know whether he can be impeached. So let's talk about whether he can be impeached. We can't talk about whether he can be impeached till we know what powers he has. <laughs> and so you just went in a circle and you're back to square one. For almost the whole summer, the plan was the president will be elected by Congress and will serve one seven year term. That's the plan into September. But the delegates were never really happy with that because that's too dependent on Congress. But it's not until the last two weeks of the convention, they take the presidency and they shove it to a committee called the Committee on Postponed Parts. And that committee redesigned the presidency. A four-year term, re-electable, elected by the people through an electoral college. So they, in the end, created this strong independent executive. Again, I think, because they trusted Washington so much, they were willing to make that leap. And here, I think, is the maybe the biggest reason for Washington's silence. So much of that summer is spent designing the presidency. He has to be silent. It's not appropriate for the guy who's going to hold the office someday to take the lead in designing it. But I think it's, it's amazing what happens. Washington shapes the whole presidency and he does it without saying a word. So, you know, there's, there's logic to all of this, you know. If the president is elected by Congress, then he should serve one long term so that he's not dependent on Congress for reelection and there's not corruption in the vote. But if the president is elected by the people, then it can be a shorter term and be reelectable. Now, why the Electoral College? Well, there was a feeling that if Congress elects, the president will be dependent on Congress and there's gonna be corruption and collusion in the election. So let the people elect the president. The problem with that is the delegates felt the people only know candidates within their state. And so no one is ever gonna get a majority. Every election is gonna get thrown into Congress. And so you need some broader minded people who know characters outside the state, the electors. In the convention's closing days, Mason of Virginia asked for a bill of rights. In haste to wrap things up, the convention voted down a Bill of Rights, a big mistake that almost prevented ratification. Now, remember the Articles of Confederation, no Bill of Rights. 
because it does not operate on the people. The states are intermediaries between the federal government and the people. You don't need a Bill of Rights in a confederation. But now we're creating this national government of people. It will operate directly on the people. The states are no longer intermediaries. So you do need a Bill of Rights, right? Well, there's still powerful arguments against a Bill of Rights. Now, the state constitutions, they all have bills of rights. But the state constitutions are written different from the federal constitution. The state constitutions give blanket grants of power to the states, governments. And so then you have to carve out your rights with a bill of rights. The federal constitution is written differently. It enumerates the powers of Congress. Those are the only powers Congress has. So you don't need to carve out your rights with a Bill of Rights. And it's actually dangerous to have a Bill of Rights because that implies that Congress is not limited to its enumerated powers. On top of that, it's really dangerous to start listing your rights <laughs> because if you omit anything, you have surrendered it. Madison, not at the convention, but later, he would sarcastically call a Bill of Rights, quote, a parchment barrier. A Bill of Rights is just words on a sheet of paper. That's not going to stop a tyrannical majority. It's how you design and structure a government that's going to protect people. It's checks and balances, branches and levels, that's what's gonna protect people's rights, not a sheet of paper. And we did that already as we designed the constitution. We built it in, there's no need for a bill of rights. And so Madison would say, look at the state constitutions. They all have bills of rights and the states trample people's rights left and right and the, and the bill of rights doesn't stop anything. It's, they're just parchment barriers. Madison, of course, is going to change his mind on this issue pretty quickly and become the father of the Bill of Rights. All right, the final constitution written by Governor Morris of Pennsylvania, a brilliant writer and quite a character. He had a peg leg because he lost his leg in a carriage accident. And apparently he was quite the womanizer. When he lost his leg in the carriage accident, and this is true, John Jay wrote, it would have been better if he had lost something else in the carriage accident. So Morris writes the final constitution, including the preamble. He organizes it into articles, seven articles. Article one is the legislature, article two is the executive and so on. The finished constitution is signed on September 17th. All right, here's a trivia question for you. There were 55 delegates total. 41 were there on the last day and three refused to sign. So how many signatures on the constitution? Well, that's easy. 41 minus three is 38, right? <laughs> Wrong. There's 39 signatures on the Constitution because one guy signed twice. George Reed of Delaware signed his own name and he signed John Dickinson's name. Dickinson was sick. Franklin's most important speech came on the last day, calling for unanimous support among the delegates. Everybody should sign. We all have our objections but let's put our doubts aside and give this thing a chance. Franklin urged that they sign by state delegation. That way everybody can sign, even if you personally oppose because your state as a whole is for it. Well, nevertheless, there were three non-signers. All feared the constitution would lead to monarchy or aristocracy. George Mason, 
he was upset by his double loss. He wanted the slave trade closed, it was left open. He wanted a super majority on commercial laws and he lost that as well. Mason is afraid that the South is gonna become a hopeless minority. Mason is already anticipating civil war and secession. Edmund Randolph wanted the states to propose amendments to be considered by a second constitutional convention. This is amazing. Randolph offered the Virginia plan, wrote the first committee of detailed draft, and now he's refusing to sign. And Elbridge Gary of Massachusetts, the third non-signer, he wanted greater protections against the standing army. Gary wanted the United States military, the US standing army to be limited to 3000 men and no more. According to legend, I don't know, I don't know if it's really true, but according to legend, Gary says, I move that the US military never exceed 3000 men. And then George Washington, again, according to legend moves I move that no invasion of the United States ever exceeds 3,000 men. Well, that's the end of Gary's proposal. As the delegates are signing, Franklin points to Washington's chair and he says, you know, artists have a very hard time distinguishing a rising and a setting sun. You know, how do you paint a rising sun versus a setting sun? They look the same. And so I've been staring at this sun all summer long, says Franklin. Now I know it's a rising sun for America. Well, that was a bit optimistic because ratification was gonna be a nail biter. As Franklin is heading home on the last day from the convention, this lady stops him in the street, Elizabeth Powell, the wife of the mayor of Philadelphia. And she says, Dr. Franklin, what kind of a government have you created? And Franklin says, what kind of government, my dear, we have created a republic if you can keep it. You know, they, they launched an experiment with this constitution in Republican government. It was up to the American people to prove to the world it could work. And, and that's a struggle. And it's really not until the end of the Civil War that it becomes really clear that the experiment is a success and that a government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. I want to wrap this up with a wonderful, I think, um, historical tidbit. On September 14th, 1787, which is not the last day of the convention, but just about, the Philadelphia Light Horse Cavalry held a dinner in honor of Washington at the City Tavern on 2nd Street. This is not the original City Tavern. It is an exact reproduction that was built in 1976 for the Bicentennial. I just wanna share with you the final bill for that evening. Dinners for 55 gentlemen, 20 pounds sterling, 54 bottles of Madeira, 20 pounds, 60 bottles of Claret, 21 pounds, eight bottles old stock, three pounds, 22 bottles of Porter, two pounds, eight bottles of cider, one pound, 12 bottles of beer, one pound, seven large bowls of punch, four pounds, cigars, two pounds, wine glasses broken, one pound, dinners for 16 musicians, two pounds, 16 bottles of claret for musicians, five pounds, five bottles of Madeira for musicians, one pound, seven bowls of punch for musicians, two pounds, for a grand total of 89 pounds and some change. That's three bottles of alcohol per person, plus the punch. And this 89 pounds, that's like $15,000 in today's dollars. 
So these guys, they knew how to celebrate a job well done. Now those musicians, who were these musicians? Let me read some of their names and you guess who they are. George Christliff, Mr. Schultz, Mr. Trenninger, John Kaiser, William Hartung, Philip Rotti, David Kartsrock, John Bruner, Conrad Spangenberg. Who are these guys? Well, obviously they're Germans, right? They're Hessians. They were hired by the British as mercenaries to fight in the revolution. Washington captured 900 of them in the Battle of Trenton. He offered them amnesty, become Americans. Many did, and they settled in the Germantown section of Philadelphia, which is where my school, LaSalle University, is located today. All right, that's it, thank you. That was fun. That was a party. Um, <laughs> I have several uh, questions here for you. So um, without going too far down the road of ratification, how did things go down in Congress when the convention closes and somebody delivers the results to Congress? And this is demonstrably not what they asked for. <laughs> right. So um, one of the things Congress had, a, I mean, um, the convention had a huge debate about, as you can imagine, is ratification procedure. You know, how many states does Congress have to approve or not? They decided Congress does not have to approve. We're just going to send it to them, and it's going to be the states that are going to approve, not the state legislatures, though, ratification conventions. So it's the convention secretary, William Jackson who delivers the Constitution to Congress in New York, along with a beautifully written cover letter that was also written by Governor Morris. And so now it's in Congress's hands. And so Congress has to decide what to do with it. And so you can imagine the anti-federalist leaning congressmen, especially Richard Henry Lee of Virginia, they don't like this thing. <laughs> and uh, they want to amend it. And there's a big debate, but the Federalists in Congress, what they're able to engineer is a resolution where Congress doesn't approve it, but they agree to unanimously simply transmit it to the states. But of course, the transmittal looks like approval, <laughs> but it really wasn't an approval. So it was a clever uh, ploy by the Federalists in Congress just to, to get over that first hurdle and get this thing onto the states. That must have come as a particular surprise to the state of Rhode Island who had elected to not participate. <laughs> <laughs> um, do we have a sense from, from Rhode Island you know, why did they choose not to go and what kind of what was the reaction there? Well, you know, in Massachusetts, you have this thing called Shays Rebellion, which is um, Western Massachusetts farmers, many of them Revolutionary War veterans who are really suffering economically, you know, um, after the war. And they're suppressed in Massachusetts. But it's the same type of people as the Shaysites in Massachusetts who actually dominate the vote in Rhode Island. And you know, they're they're pretty happy with things as as they are. We de we decentralized power down to the state level and the revolution is over. And so, you know, we're not sympathetic to this constitutional reform movement. We're not going to participate. And then, you know, um, Rhode Island put the question of holding a ratification convention to a state referendum. And time and again, the people in Rhode Island voted it down. We're, we're not even going to hold a ratification convention. But eventually, of course, um, the other states do ratify. George Washington becomes president. And then the United States starts to turn the screws on Rhode Island, you know. 
okay, you're not going to be part of the United States. Well, we're going to collect our portion, uh, you know, your, your share of the Revolutionary War debt, you know, you're going to pay that. And we're going to set up all sorts of trade barriers against Rhode Island. <laughs> and Washington in, in um, 1789, he tours the New England states, but he will not set foot in Rhode Island. And so he goes from Connecticut directly into Massachusetts, and, and he will not touch Rhode Island. It's a foreign country. But then Rhode Island finally ratifies, and just like that, Washington makes a special trip to Rhode Island to welcome them. Such a just such an interesting story. Um, how how all states actually come on board, but such a yeah fraught time with the, the with the ratification all around. Um, I've I got a question here pertaining to Madison's service as a congressman. So, you know, once the constitution goes into place, then Madison is now a congressman. So do you have a sense of why he never wanted to be a senator and he instead spent his, his career as more of a legislator? Yeah, well, um, in my Washington Madison book, you know, I. I suggest that, that Madison could have had a cabinet a post if he wanted it. You know, Washington, I think, would have appointed him Secretary of State. Um, but he wanted to be a legislator. And he announced that he would rather serve in the House than the Senate. That may have been sort of sour grapes because <laughs> you know, Patrick Henry rules the Virginia legislature and the legislature chooses the first senators, right? And so they choose two anti-federalists. So, um, so maybe Madison knew he had no chance at the Senate, but um, what he said is that he believed that senators would be expected to live this high and mighty lifestyle and do a lot of entertaining. And Madison was afraid that, that, that it, he wouldn't be able to afford to be a senator. And I think he also had a sense that maybe the more productive house in, or, or the more productive chamber in terms of legislation was gonna be the House of Representatives. So, you know, put all that together and uh, you get Madison in, in, in the House versus the Senate. All right, well, um... I've got one, one final question here, which is just an interesting one. So um, posing this question as George Washington, it's September 17th and it's time for us to sign off on the constitution. But before we do, can you, Dr. Livier, uh, think of any one single measure that may well cause us mischief down the road, which we may ought rethink? Well, you know, Washington does make his, his, his second and final <laughs> speech on the last day. And the thing he asks for is to um, make the size of congressional districts smaller. They were one per 40,000 people. Washington asked to make it one per 30,000 people. So that was his, you know, final request and being George Washington, everybody immediately says, oh, that's a wonderful idea. Let's do it. <laughs> um, that may have been also partially designed to get the non-signers to sign. But if it was, it didn't work. But it's interesting that the, you know, the one thing Washington asks for is not to make the government more powerful or the executive more powerful. It's to make the government more, more democratic, really, is, is, the, is the thing he asks for. Well, thank you so much. We're, we're up at 6.30. So um, thanks to everybody for sticking with us for the talk. And Dr. Leibiger, thank you so much for your time. Where can we find copies of your book? Well, you can order it on amazon.com and you can go directly to the ABC Clio website and order it there as well. So if you just Google ABC Clio, um, that will bring you to their website and then you should be able to find the book there. 
Excellent. Well, thank you so much. And, and I, hope, I hope you will have it at the Montpelier gift shop too. <laughs> we will work on getting it in the shop. We didn't have it ready for tonight's talk, but we will be getting it in the shop uh, sometime, hopefully later this spring. Um, but thank you so much for, for sharing your time and your thoughts with us. You know, it, we always love at Montpelier geeking out over the, the Constitutional Convention. Um, you know, and obviously everything, everything that follows. So thank you so much for, for your time and for joining us and um, participants, you will be receiving a, a copy of tonight's talk so you can reference it later and share it with your friends if you like. So thank you everybody and have a really great rest of your weekend. Thanks for the great questions. Bye. Good night.